My name is Tosh Tanaka, and uh, I was in the California National Guard from 1992 to 1998. And a part of my tour as a, as a National Guard soldier was to come to the Defense Language Institute and learn Japanese. And the Japanese language program on campus is the oldest program. Started it during World War II in, in uh, I believe it was San Francisco, and then moved to Camp Savage, Minnesota, and then finally back here to Monterey. My parents were born during the born during the internment, and they were born at, respectively my mother at, at Topaz, Utah, and my father at Gila River, Arizona. And my father's grand my father's brother was in the 442nd uh, Regimental Combat Team, and he was stationed in Italy at toward the end of the war. So he, he came home with an Italian wife. And my dad's folks were born in the United States, all from Los Angeles. We were all from LA. My mom's folks, however, were, were both born in Japan. And growing up, I didn't know anything about the internment. Growing up, I didn't know anything about my grandfather's brother, Uncle Tsukasa. I didn't know anything about his service. But I knew he, he had served. I knew he was in the Army. My father was in the Air Force, and my uncle, my Uncle Barry, his youngest brother, my father's youngest brother, he was in the Army. And so I thought, well, that, that's just what you did. You grew up and you joined the service, right? You, you become a service person, and you give back to the country in, in a way, some way. And at that time, in, in, in how we were thinking, you joined the service. I really didn't know that I wanted to be a Japanese linguist. And I thought it was an interesting opportunity when it was, it was time for me to go through recruiting and go through the, the military entrance processing station. And they ask you, so what do you want to do? And they give you this battery of tests before you, you make it that far. And they say, well, you've done very well on the, the this thing called the ASVAB, and I don't remember what that thing stands for, but it's your ability to absorb languages. Before then, I, I had no Japanese, none. I, I'd heard it growing up, but I didn't really know what they were saying. And this is mainly from my, my mom's folks. No idea. But I thought it would be an interesting thing. It, it, wow, the government is going to pay me to go somewhere and learn the language of my grandparents? Far out! That's great. I'll, I could do that, or at least I could try to do that. I mean, the, the tests say that I can do it. And, and so I wanted to, but I couldn't take an, an, enough time away from school because at that point in my life, I was 21, way too far beyond my time in school that I should have been out. And, and so I was like a super senior. So I was in between my junior and senior year going into the, the reserve or the, going into the California National Guard. And I thought, nah, I can't do it because I'm, I'm between years. I need to graduate. I need to get out of school. And so I, I did something else. I chose to become a, an electronics repair person. So I went and learned how to do that. And then I came back to my unit in California. Didn't like doing it. College friend of mine, his brother was a lieutenant at, the point, at that time. And the California National Guard was forming a brand new linguist unit. That's the 223rd Military Intelligence Battalion. They're based in San Francisco. And he says to me, hey, what, what? we can send you to DLI. Really? You'll do that? Yeah, we'll send you to DLI. You become an interrogator. We'll send you to DLI. And then after DLI, we can send you to Japan. Oh, OK. So I graduate. I come to DLI. And here I am for 63 weeks, not knowing anything. Not only am I not knowing anything, but I am one of six students in class, one of two Army students in class, and one of the only of, of two enlisted people in class. So the other four folks were officers, Navy and Air Force officers. Because, and, and not only that, I, I was the only Japanese American in the entire school as a student. So that, too, was, was very interesting. Because I had heard it growing up, I, I, I've always been good at listening. I can hear it. And I think that that listening and hearing it growing up enabled me to speak a little bit better, or at least to, to the native speaker's ear, I sound like I know more than what I do.
and it gets me into trouble. And a lot of this is due to the training at DLI. Okay, so you, you, they, they, go, they push you through all of this stuff. They just push and push and push and you do it all. From day one, they don't speak English. Everyone, everything's in Japanese. Everything's in Japanese. And it's from the most basic greetings to, well, these are what these units are doing. This is what this unit is going to do. And these units will link up and do this and blah, blah, blah. All these military talk. So on top of the military talk and on top of the grace basic greetings, we have to learn times of day. We have to learn all these things that are going to help us learn more about the language. Because it, 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 the language school is not the end-all be-all. Once you graduate, you don't know everything, right? It's like trying to go and learn English for a year, if you can imagine. They learn, try and learn English in 63 weeks and expect to know everything. You can't. You, don't, you just don't do it. So that what they call it is, is basic acquisition. And so you're given, we were given the tools necessary to complete our education on our own, really. So we were, giving, we were given really specialized dictionaries on top of some commercially available dictionaries. The Japanese language program at the Defense Language Institute 63 weeks long. So that means you, you go from week one to week 63, five days a week throughout those 63 weeks, and you spend eight or nine hours a day in class speaking nothing but the language. So it's not only speaking, but it's also reading, writing, culture studies, listening, doing a lot of things. And since I wasn't a, a, a brand new soldier in the Army, I had, I had had a previous occupation, and so now is switching occupations to become a, a military linguist and interrogator, I was something called prior service. So that means I had been in the Army for a little bit. So they, they separate people who are career and, and prior service versus the, the new recruits. And so I, I came in as prior service as well as uh, being a junior NCO. So I was a, a corporal at the time. And so I was barracks in, yeah, building 645. And the, the view from my room was the most stunning of the bay ever. I think the entire side of our building was just, you couldn't pick a bad room. I was on the, what, the third floor, looked out over the bay. I was able to see the landing lights at the airport. A typical day at, at DLI at that time in Alpha Company started like this. So you, you get up, about five, for me it was five. Some mornings I ran, so we got up a little bit earlier, about 4. And uh, we made first formation at about 7.30. That means that all the company soldiers get together and you, you, you account for everybody and they say, go to school, okay, bye. And so we went to school and, and school lasted from, I think it was 8 in the morning. We got a break for lunch at um, about 11.30 and we started class it was either 12.30 or 1 o'clock. And then we went until, I think we stopped at 4 or 4.30. And then depending on the time of year it was, depending if it was fall, we would do our physical training in the afternoon. And in the spring and summer times, we would, we would train in the morning. Our school day didn't end after we left the schoolhouse. So we would leave the schoolhouse, we would do PT, we would eat dinner, and then we would have another three or four hours of homework on top of that. A lot of that was listening practice, reading practice, translation practice, um, and some speaking practice. And so that went on for 63 weeks. And there, there are not many, many language programs on DLI that are 63 weeks long. And the languages are categorized between, uh, I think it's two and five. And I think the categories go something like the distance away it is from English in terms of grammar, speech patterns, um, strange tones that we can't make or we don't use in English, um, different writing patterns and, and, and ways of writing. So Spanish, French, German, very similar to English because we all come from that same kind of language. Russian, a little bit different because you use Cyrillic and not uh, a Romanized letters. And then, where, where is that?
uh, Persian Farsi, and Arabic. And I think at the time there was still Greek. I don't think they, they, they teach Greek any longer, but I think Greek is in that same sort of category as those other languages, those, those other two languages, Arabic and Persian Farsi. And then you got Chinese and Japanese and Thai and Tagalog. Thai and Viet, Thai and Vietnamese. They are all within our same sort of category five, which is the furthest away from English, the least like English of all of these other languages. That means that you're there for 63 weeks, you're there longer than anybody else. So, you know, you got folks coming for Spanish, you make friends with them, and they're gone. Just like that. You blink your eye and they're gone and they speak Spanish. And you're like, well, I'm still here. I, what, what? I still have another three months, five months to go. And, and it, it's a very interesting thing being a, 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 a Japanese learner or a 63-week program kind of person because you're there for the longest amount of time. You get to know the area a lot better than those folks who are only here for three months learning Spanish, French, German, Italian. And Monterey was a, a really cool town to hang out in. And so when we weren't doing PT, when we weren't doing these other required military things, when we weren't doing homework, but that was most of the time anyway, so we're, we're talking a few hours out of each day, if even that, a little bit of time on the weekends perhaps, my friends and I would run. We would run a Silomar. So we would leave our barracks at DLI run out the west gate, run around to Silmar and Lover's Point, and come back to the barracks. And it was about 10 miles. Sometimes it, it, it was, and these were all preparatory for the battalion runs, because the battalion runs a lot of times was about six miles, making a, a shorter loop through neighborhoods and those kinds of things. But coming back up Alvarado, and if you haven't been here before, and if you're here now, Go up toward DLI, go up Alvarado Street, go up that hill. We would run that once a month as a group. And now a battalion, if you don't know this either, a battalion of people, in the DLI sense, it's about a thousand folks running up that hill. <laughs> All in a big line, you know, four people or five people across. Yeah, it was more than was four people across and we would, everyone would run it. And yeah, it hurt. It hurt a lot. So as it turned out, I didn't graduate with my class, not because I didn't do well, but because I was pulled out of class and sent overseas. I was sent to Japan before my classmates even made it there because I was supporting a bilateral training exercise. I think that one was in Sendai, Japan. Sendai, Japan, where the earthquake was and the tsunami hit, which I, did, I had no idea. I had no idea what that place was going to be like. But what I thought was really interesting was, as soon as I got off the plane, I don't know how everybody else felt, but I'm like, wait, I can read everything. Could, can you? No, they can't. They couldn't read everything. And I thought, my goodness. What? Really? I mean, just everything that I learned in the last 63 weeks, I'm doing it, and it works? I don't need my flashcards anymore. I can just read the signs, and it... And the same thing when I spoke to folks. That my first mission was to translate a briefing for the commander of, I don't even remember what the unit was, but for the commander of the American unit to the commanders of the Japanese units, done, gangbusters. Like I had been doing it for years. Everything that that guy said, I just spoke right back out in Japanese. It was amazing. And that was a while ago. And to this day, I, I, I haven't used it as much, but it, it comes back. The Defense Language Institute is, is always a place of necessity, or it always has been a place of necessity from World War II to where we are today, through the Cold War and everything else. But the, the way that languages are taught there and the intensity in which they are taught, the time commitment that is given by the students, and it's really up to you as, as a learner, there's nothing else like it. There are no other programs that I have seen that teach languages 
like the Defense Language Institute. Because having been away now for so long, I can still recall it. It's still in my head. And I don't, I don't think I'd be the same person that I am today if I had not gone to DLI. And in that, that a lot of doors open because you know a second language. And looking like I do, is a lot of times people expect you to know that other language, or that other language they expect you to know. Oh, can you speak that? Oh, yeah, I can. And I don't, they don't need to know that I'm fourth generation. I grew up speaking English. But yeah, I can. And not only that, but I, I was able to serve my country. I did my part. And um, yeah, especially being here in Monterey. I, I think that there's something about this place being on the southern tip of the bay that it made it easy for me to learn here. This is a very comfortable place to learn another language. Very beautiful and comfortable place to learn another language. So maybe that's why it's sunk in so well.